Welcome to a fee way excellence without stress. Hi guys, welcome back on this our beautiful FE way journey. We are back on the journey of excelling without stress, and today our topic is refraction of light, refraction of light on plain and curved surfaces, refraction of light. So, what is refraction? You know, just as we said that reflection is the bouncing back of light rays on a plain surface, but refraction occurs between two medias look for example look at this light ray it's coming from air and it entered glass that is when refraction occurs so let's let us read refraction is the bending that is changing direction of a ray of light when it crosses from one medium to another e.g from air to glass that is when refraction occurs when a light ray is moving and there is a bending look at it now the light ray was traveling was coming from air but once it entered glass there is a change in direction look at it now if this place was 30 this one is automatically lesser than 30. There is a bending. So the speed of light is different in different media. For instance, instance light travels faster in air than in glass you can remember when we we're talking about um, sound waves we know that we said sound travels faster in what in solid than in air but the reverse is the case when it comes to light ray light travels faster in what in air than in other media because of their densities so this when light crosses from one medium to another there is a change in its velocity refraction then takes place you know velocity is the speed yeah relation the velocity is like is basically the speed abby so since there's a change in velocity refraction does what takes place laws of refraction just the same way as we had laws of reflection we have laws of refraction the laws of refractions are one the incident ray the refracted ray and the normal at the point of incidence all lie on the same plane you can remember that that when we talked about the laws of reflection we said the incident ray the reflected ray and the normal at the point of incidence all lie on the same plane but for the law of refraction we have the incident ray the refracted ray and the normal at the point of incidence all lie on the same plane the second law says, for a given pair of media, the radius of the sign of the angle of incidence to the sign of the angle of refraction is a constant. It is also known as what? Snell's law. So that is what it's talking about. So we have that sign I, refractive index of whatever it is from air to glass, from glass to air. You know, refractive, refractive index occurs when light ray is moving from one medium to another, one media to another. So look at it now. When it's going from air to glass, it will be sign I over what? Sign R. And N is the refractive index. So when you say refractive index, is equal to sin i over sin r it, you are talking about the snell's law so those are the two laws we have the first one and the snell's law refractive index the higher the refractive index of a medium the optically denser the medium is again the higher the refractive index of a medium the optically denser the medium is for air refractive of refractive index one this means that water with refractive index 1.33 is optically denser than air as simple as that there is nothing much about that let's go to the next slide real and apparent depth even with the um, english meaning i know you already know what that means real is just how it is exactly the real deal just like when we are talking about images formed by um, um, concave mirrors we had the real image and the virtual the real images were the images formed in front of, in front of the mirror while the virtual images were formed behind that is the rays of light were not meeting but we're going to just actually try to act as if they are meeting so those are a virtual image because images are formed when light rays meet so but this one are real and apparent depths it's is so simple it's just like when see let's read this when one look into the deep pool water it appears shallower yeah you think that oh this thing is not deep now let me just go in until you're not going and you start notice that ah i've not got into the um down part of this pool so one sees a false depth so false is apparent depth likewise if you place a glass block on the writings on the page the letters come closer to you yes if you put a glass on on a paper and maybe you wrote oh something on it refraction the refraction it, the letters will look as if they are closer to you and that is what is called a false depth apparent depth so the false depth is called the apparent depth while the actual depth is called real depth so refractive index is equals to real depth divided by apparent depth why is this important because refraction is what causes this you remember that this light ray now is traveling from where it's traveling from here and it's coming into your eyes another medium this was a medium going to another medium from water to what so, air, don't forget that if light ray is traveling from a 
less dense to a denser medium what will happen it will bend so that is what that's that that was what happened look at the light ray now when you look at it now it will look as if oh this thing is very close to me but in actual sense it is very very deep so that is what the real and actual depth is so the refractive index of it is equal to what real depth divided by the what apparent depth refraction in less is just the same way as we had reflection in what in mirror so there are two main types of lenses we have the concave which is diverging and we have the convex which is what converging lenses there are two main types of lenses concave diverging convex and what converging as you remember when we're talking about mirrors we have concave or what converging Abby, but for lenses, it is concave or what diverging and convex or what converging lenses. All other types of lenses are variants of the two below. When parallel ray of light falls on a convex lens, they are refracted to converge at a point. We can see this. This is a convex lens. The convex lens actually works like the concave mirror, while the concave lens works like the what the convex mirror. Let's not mix that. It's so simple. So it is a convex lens that converges, while the concave mirror what diverges. You can see the light ray is diverged but this one they came together to meet at a point so when parallel rays falls on a convex lens they are refracted to converge at a point its focus hence the name converging lens yes they converge at this point so this is the point of focus so why the concave lens on the other hand this uh, this one after refraction they diverge yes they diverge so a convex lens is con is converging while the concave mirror is also what converging so convex concave mirror con convex lens concave mirror are both converging while the concave lens and the convex mirror are both what diverging rules for image formation you know i've already explained this to us that when we're talking about um, um uh, mirror uh, images formed by the mirror i told you that this is not like the plain mirror for the plain mirror it returns whatever it is you put if you are tall it will show you as being tall not that you will be tall and you'll be your head will be touching the floor something is definitely wrong right so for the convex lenses the position you have will determine where the image will be formed it's not a constant it's not the same it's not same size it's not the same type of image it's not all you get so the rules for images formed by convex lenses understanding the behavior of light rays of light ray passing through a convex lens is essential to understanding image formation luckily for us for image formation by convex lenses there are rules once you can follow that rule you will not have mistake in determining where the images are formed there are three basic rules that summarize the behavior of light ray through a convex lens simple rules first a light ray that is parallel to the principal axis passes through the focus on the other side of the lens after refraction let's check that let's see our light ray yeah this is the light ray let's call it light ray a look at it coming and what happened is there was refraction but this is the rule any light ray that is parallel to the principal axis this is the principal axis so let me just quickly explain this line this is the optical center so this f1 is the focus this f22 is the focus the um, f1 is the same length f1 and f2 here they have the same length from the optical center so if the optical center to f1 is 5 the optical center to f22 is 5 if the optical center of um from from the optical center to 2f1 is 10 also the from the optical center to 2f2 is is also 10 because f1 2f2 is twice of what f1 that is just what it means so look at it now the first rule says that if the light ray is traveling parallel to the principal axis what happens it goes through the word focus on the other side first a light ray that is parallel to the principal axis passes through the focus on the other side of the lens after refraction that rule is so important the second one says a light ray that passes through the optical center of the lens does not change direction can you see that if it passes through the optical center it continues moving in a straight line there is no what refraction there is no change there is no bending of the light ray so that is the second rule and the third one says a light ray that goes through the focus moves parallel to the principal axis after refraction so you can see this light ray was coming and it went through the focus how will it then be refracted it will go what parallel have you seen that parallel and let me just show you something rule number one and rule number three are the reverse of each other because of the what law of reversibility of light because this one was going parallel to the principal axis it came to the focal at this side this one that was not going to the focal what happened it's 
became parallel to the what principal axis those are the that that that's, that shows the law of reversibility of light and the same goes there the same law have you seen it have you seen the way it looks here too when it was parallel it's going to diverge up it's not going to go it's just the opposite of this this one so once it goes through the optical center it's going to it's not going to change direction so let's go quickly so the principle of reversibility of light the principle of reversibility of light states that light follows the same paths if the direction of a light ray is reversed we've seen that the principle explains why the first and the second rule are opposite each other we can identify where the image of an object will be formed by tracing the light that comes from a specific part of the object it is enough to draw two light rays from the top of the object and see where the rays meet so what we are trying to say here is when we want to try to know where the images formed by convex lenses are we just need to use two of the rules like the first and the second whatever the two of them meet is where the image will be formed don't worry you understand so examples of image formed Formation by convex lenses. I already told you, just like the convex mirror, the position of the object will determine where the image and the type of image that will be formed. When using a convex lens, the resulting image depends on the distance of the object from the lens. There are five special cases that can be distinguished based on the object's distance. One, if the object is formed beyond two focal distance, then the image will be real, inverted, and diminished in size. Don't forget that two focal. You know we had on our principal axis. What do we have? We have the optical center. We have f1. We have two f1. On the other side, we had f2 and what two f2. So they said if the object is beyond the two focal, that is after two f2, then the image will be real, inverted and diminished. That is small in size. Real. That is, there is going to be a meeting of the light rays. That is, we are going to see the points where the two light rays meet. That's what is called real. Then, if the object is exactly at the focal distance, you know, this was this happened when we, we placed if it was in the mirror is when it's on the center of curvature. So, if the object is exactly at two focal distance, then the image will also be real. That is, the light rays will meet. You know, the two rules. Like, you know what you understand? It will be inverted also, and, it's, and it will be the same size as the object. This one was diminished. The next one is what? is, is um, same size let's go so if the object is between one and the two focal distances that is f and two f2 then the image will be real again inverted and enlarged check it now it's so simple diminished right the next one same size magnified then again if the object is now at the focus that is f1 you see the, the, the object, we are trying to push the object inside. We are going inside. Don't worry, I will explain to you. We are going inside. The, so if the object is at the focus, then there will be no image formed as the light rays will be what? Parallel. Then if the object is between the focus and the lens, then the image will be virtual. Why? The light rays will never meet. It will be upright, okay, and enlarged inside. Don't worry, we will understand this. So this is the first case object place beyond the two focal so look at we have f2 so this one is placed beyond the two of them right so this object is placed beyond the two focal so let, we are taking the first true remember we said when if the light ray is parallel to the principal axis it will go through the focus on the other side and the other one is if the light ray goes through the optical center it will do what it will just continue to move and where did they meet they met here you see how easy it is now for you to determine where your image will be formed so so simple and and even with our eyes we can see look at this image how big it is look at this one look at how small it is so now the image is what is inverted right it is real why because the two light rays met and that is real then it is diminished because it is smaller so the image form is real it is diminished inverted and formed beyond the focus but between two focal distances. look at where it is formed it was formed between f1 and f2 so it was beyond this point but between f1 and 2 f1 so easy let's go to the next case now the object was placed you know the first one was placed beyond here now we are placing the object exactly on 2 f1 so the same rule if it is parallel to the principal axis it will go through the focus on the other side then if it is going through the optical center what happened it doesn't change direction what happened they will not meet here it's just that point so it is definitely a real image because the two light rays there is a connection they met here so it is a what a real image it is a real image then let's check what happened you notice that they are the same size so it is real 
and it's also inverted because this arrow is standing upright this one is bending so it is real it is inverted and it is same size and where is the image formed the image is formed at it's also formed at 2f can you imagine this one was formed at 2f1 the other one was formed at the second 2f2 so that is good and interesting let's go to the toy you see that we are trying to push the object inside we started beyond 2f then on 2f1 we, we started beyond 2f1 then on 2f1 now we are putting between 2f1 and f1 so what happened we're going to put our two rules the first one is here right so when it passes through the print um when it's um it's parallel to the principal axis it goes through the f2 the next one again when it goes through the optical center there is a meeting wow i'm sure we've noticed this it is magnified right and it is produced after at the opposite side at the formed beyond 2f2 at the other side is that also and look at it's still inverted so the characteristics of the image form is magnified as we can see with our height it is inverted upside down it is real because yeah the two light rays still add a meeting point so it is real and where was it formed beyond the two focus so at the opposite side of the lens interesting let's go now so objects between f and the lens so now you know it has moved so now this object now is formed between f and the lens so what happened characteristics of the image formed so look at it now the first rule we use the first rule when it's parallel to the principal axis it goes through f and the other one what happened when it's going through the optical center what happened it goes continuous you see what happened now there is no meeting point so there's going to be a virtual image because two of them cannot meet even looking at it there is no way these are parallel rays they can never meet so characteristics of the image form the image is virtual because there is actually not a meeting but we are the one that just puts uh, a virtual form of formation of the image here yeah. and that is what this, this is a virtual image here yeah. so image is formed on the same side you can see the image here yeah. the virtual image is on the same side it's not on the opposite side of the object the image is red can you see it is standing straight and the image is magnified is that not interesting yes very interesting so those are the cases we have you know we had five one we don't form anything and those were the four good cases then we have the convex lens abby the convex lens forms image by the refraction of light as shown above yes the image formation in a convex lens is very similar to the image formation in a concave mirror yes i mentioned that hence the nature and formation of the image formed by a converging lens depends on the position of the object yes it depends on the position but for the concave lens just like a convex no matter the position wherever you keep it either you put it on 2f you put it between you put it on the focal you put it anywhere you put it it's going to return just a type of image the image that is going to return will be what erect look at the image it will be diminished it will be virtual and it will be formed between the object and the lens that is just one thing you need to know no matter the place you place it it's not like that for the convex lens that anywhere you put it with the time but for the concave lens just like the convex mirror no matter the position no matter where you keep them it's going to return this type of image put it here the image will be erect diminished virtual put it here the same thing so let's proceed the lens formula just as we had the mirror formula we have the lens formula and they are the same thing the object distance and the image distance v are related this is it this is i over u u you just take the o as the u which is the object distance i is the image distance and f is the focal length so let's not forget you remember our magnification formula yes this is image height over object height this is the v which is the image distance over object distance we did this when we were talking about the what the mirror formula it is the same thing and look at it now this in our shoulders this is our object right this is our image so this distance from the optical center to this point is the object distance also from the optical center to this point is the what image distance that is how we check that is how we we measure it that is how we measure and then you can be you will be able to get your what focus f Uses of the convex lens. These are what the convex lenses are used for: microscope, camera lens, projectors, flashlights, magnifying lens, and telescopes. Then the concave lens are used for binoculars, telescope, eyeglasses, and flashlights. Refraction through prism. Refraction through prism. So there are two types of prism. We have the rectangular prism. This is it. And we have the triangular prism. We have the rectangular prism, and we have the what? The triangular prism. So let's continue. Prism. Rays are produced from rectangular prism which has the angle of refraction 
either produced from the normal or produced to the normal. But traits transmitted through a triangular prism are always refracted towards the normal. They are always refracted towards the normal. Look at it, always refracted towards the normal and close to the base of the triangular prism. So let's look at this image very quickly. This is our light ray coming in. Abby, so look at it now. We have PE as our incident ray. It is the light ray coming in, traveling in a straight line. So PE is called the what? The light, the incident ray. So don't forget, when light ray is traveling from one one medium to another there must be a bending so what happened this is the same light ray but what is this this is called the refracted ray because it has moved from one medium towards another supposing there was a bouncing back here it will be reflection but because it has moved from air to glass refraction right so and this is the refracted ray so a f e and f is the word refracted ray so now we now have F, S, F and S, that is the word emergent ray. That is the ray of light. You know, it came like this. Inside there is called refracted. That is this ray that is coming. It's the same thing I did what that came out here. That is what is called the refracted ray. And this angle is the what angle of the prism. It can be 60. If it's 60, 60, 60, you know, that is a what equilateral triangle. So this is I am angle I is the angle of incidence. This point is the angle of incidence, angle of refraction. The, this is the emergence angle, sorry. This is the angle E, emergence angle, and D, the angle of what? Deviation. This is the angle of deviation. So don't forget that. So minimum deviation DM of the light occurs when the ray passes symmetrically, passes symmetrically through the what? The prism. That's where we get the what? Angle of deviation. You can see the angle of deviation now. Look at this incident ray. This is, this is just like its virtual part. The reflected, sorry, 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 why is it in doing like that? And for the emergent ray, this is it. So the point where the, the incident ray, the virtual part of the incident ray and the emergent meet is where we're going to have our what? Angle of deviation. We can see that this is actually the incident ray, but this, you can see this dotted line outside, yes? And for the emergent ray, you can see the dotted line. So this point gives us our angle of what? Deviation. Refractive index of an equilateral triangle. How can we get this? So look at this now. When I1, which is this point, is equal to I2. Let's assume that, okay, we are saying I1, this first um, I, is equal to I2. Then what happens? A plus the angle of deviation is equal to what? 2I. Don't forget that. If I1 is equal to I2, then we can say A plus D is equal to what? 2I. Or I1 is equal to A plus D over 2. Do we understand that? Let's go to our board to quickly do that. Sorry. Oh, God. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh God, our body, is, our body refuses to work today. I don't know why. Oh God. Okay, so let's just try to explain. So when I1 is equal to I2, we say that A plus D is equal to 2I. Is equal to 2I. So our I1 is equal to A plus D. You know how we did that. We said A plus D is equal to 2I. So if I'm making I1 the subject of formula, what will happen? It will be A plus D divided by 2. So we have gotten I1, right? Our I1. Okay, let's keep it there. Don't forget, if I1 is equal to I2, what happened? R1 is equal to also equals to what? R2. You remember that? So if I1 is equal to I2, definitely the angle of what? Refraction. We also be equal to the second one. This is R1 and this is R2. So if I1 is equal to I2 or I2, R2 will also be equal to what? R2. So we have that. So R1 plus R1 is equal R1 plus R2 is equal to what? Is equals to A. So R1 plus R2 is equals to A. I1 plus I2, if I1 is equals to i2 then definitely r1 is also equals to what r2 and the addition of r1 and r2 is equals to the angle of that of the what's it called of the prism the addition of the refracted ray one and refracted ray two 
is equal to the angle of the triangular prism, which is A. So definitely, if I had R1 plus R2 together, what am I going to be having? I'll be having 2R1, right? I'll be having 2R1, and 2R1 is then equals to A. Then what is my A? My A, or what is my R1? My R1 is equals to A over 2. Do you understand that? We have, let's put that together. So it means now we have I which is the incidence angle, right? We have the angle of incidence will be what? A plus D divided by 2. We have R now. We've established that R also is A over 2. Don't forget that. When I is equals to... Let me start again because we are, our, board is, our board refuses to work today. Let's just quickly check. Let's just try to explain it like that. Let me re-explain so you can understand. When I, this angle here, the angle of incidence here, is equal to I2. Do you get it now? Then we have our A which is the angle of the prism plus D to be equal to what? 2I. Then if we make I the subject of formula, we're going to have A plus D divided by 2. So we have gotten I, our angle of incidence. The formula is there. So in the same vein, when I1 is equal to I2, R1 also will be equal to what? I2. And don't forget, R1 plus R2 is what? Equal to the angle of the prism. That is established. And if I had the two together, it's going to give me 2R1. 2R1 is equal to A. Then R1 will just be A over 2. Get, don't, don't forget something that refractive index is equal to what? Sine I over sine R. I think we remember that from our Snell's law. So if refractive index is sine high over sine R, what is it going to be? Sine I that we derived here. That is A plus D over 2. Over what? Sine R, which is what? A over 2. Are we clear? Or let me just take it one more time. When I is equals to I2, A plus D, which is the angle of the prism, and D, which is the angle of deviation, is equals to what? 2I, or I1 is equals to A plus D divided by 2. Angle of minimum deviation, the, uh, deviation is D, which is equals to A plus D divided by 2. Right? We have our I already, which is the angle of incidence. So also, when I1 is equals to I2, definitely R1 is also equal to R2. Exactly, and don't forget, R1 plus R2 gives us the angle of the prism. So R1 plus R2 is equal to A. So 2R1 is equal to A. Then R1 is equal to A over 2. And from the law, um, Snell's law, sine I is equal to um, a refractive index is equal to sine I over what? Over sine R. So the refractive index of a triangular prism can be given as sine A plus D over 2, which was the I we got here, divided by sine A over 2, which was the R we got here. So that's how we've established the angle of incidence. So the critical angle, the critical angle. Ah, we have a lot of things to solve. Why is our board not working? Why is our board not working? Okay, let's proceed. Let's proceed. Let's proceed. Guess I will try my best to explain it. Oh, God. So the critical angle. The critical angle is the angle of incidence. Let's not forget that. In the denser medium, where the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is 90 degrees. Don't forget that. The critical angle is the angle of incidence in the denser medium when the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is 90. There's one important thing about the angle of the critical angle. It only occurs when light ray is traveling from a denser to a less dense. For example, from water to air from glass to air. So that is when critical angle does what? Does occur. So the critical angle is the angle of incidence in the denser medium. So in this denser medium, what we call the angle of incidence is no angle of incidence. There is a change of name. So the critical angle, when light ray is traveling from a denser to a less dense medium, the critical angle is the angle of incidence in the denser medium when the angle of refraction, you can see the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is what? Is 90 degrees. You know that ideally, when a light ray is traveling like this, it can come out. But in, in this case, the light ray travel, 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 and now the light ray is here. The reason why it's called a critical angle is because after this point, it's not going to be refracting again. Ideally, refraction is supposed to bend but this refraction here is already close it's already at 90 degree critical you know when you say something is critical it is a situation that after this situation no, something can happen so that is what has happened after this point this light ray will enter this point and that is like reflection 
it and we are going to talk about it in the next um this thing which is a uh, total internal reflection so the critical angle is the angle of incidence normally this light is supposed to refract but when the angle of refraction is 90 degree that is what what is called the critical angle the critical angle is the angle of incidence is the denser medium when the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is 90. so now can we get our formula don't forget this light ray is moving from what from a abby to where to b it's going outside so this light ray is moving from a to b is that not so yes so normally we know that if light ray is traveling from um a, a less dense to a dense amidon we have sine i over what over sine r is that not so we have sine i over sine r that is the normal um movement like maybe it's traveling from air to glass from air to water that's when we have sine i over sine r but look at in this case we said the angle of refraction is what is 90 degree let's not forget that the angle of refraction is what is 90 degree so now normally when it is going from air to water it is sine i over sine r right so we have it here that sine c because that is what is called now it is the critical angle is the angle of incidence we will not call it uh, incidence again it has changed its name it's just like a woman that gets married she will change her surname same thing this um this incidence angle's name will change because of what has happened to this what refracted because of the refracted ray. So the angle critical angle is the angle of incidence in the denser medium. When the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is what 90 degree. Is that clear to us now? So we have sine C over 90, and that is just the normal. That is for if we are talking about it traveling from what air to glass. So what is sine 90? Sine 90 is actually one. But now this thing is traveling from a denser to a less dense. So it means our A, our, what's it called? Refractive index, it will have to change. There must be an inverse. This one is for the normal one when light is traveling from a less dense to a denser. That's when we have sine i over sine half. But in this case, it is traveling from a denser to what? To a less dense. So we have to change this. It's going to be what? Um, sine 90, which is 1. Look at this sine 90. Look at we had b to a here, yeah, right? We had b to a. That's what this formula is. But now we are having from a to b. So if we are having from a to b, what is down? We come up. And what is up? We come down. So sine 90 is 1. Sine and then the sine C we come. So the refractive index, critical angle. So it's uh, refractive index now is now what? 1 divided by what? Sine C. 1 divided by sine C. Where C is the what? Critical angle. So we cannot get the refractive index to be what? 1 divided by what? Sine C. Let me take that again because of the lack of our board today. So look at it now. I said that. This critical angle occurs when a light ray is traveling from a denser medium to a less dense medium, right? So look at it now. This is a light ray. Ideally, it was supposed to just bend, but this is a critical period because of what? Any other push is going to not, it will not refract, it's going to what? Reflect. And we're going to talk about that soon, which is a total internal reflection. This is clear to you. And don't forget our Snell's law. Our Snell's law says that sine i is equal uh, refractive index equals to sine i over sine r yes and look at what we said critical angle is the angle of incidence so it means that this now this our angle is no longer called incidence so it's not the critical angle so we have sine c and what is the refraction they said the refraction in less than this medium is 90 so they've given us our r so we what 90 so we put it there but this is just a normal when light ray is traveling from a to b but this ray was traveling from uh, uh, was traveling this okay when it's traveling from b this is a b is a to what to a but this light ray was traveling from what a to b so what will happen there will be an inverse so sign c we go down what is our sign 90 sign 90 is one and that's why we have this as the refractive what index and this is what i'm talking about the total internal reflection so when the angle of incidence exceeds the critical angle you know what we were saying then it exceeds you know that critical angle was said the angle of incidence in the denser medium when the angle of um, this thing of refraction in the less dense medium is 19. so when the angle of incidence exceeds the critical angle there exists no reflection 
and the total reflection was there exists no refraction sorry that this should be refraction this was a mistake then what total reflection does what of course this phenomenon is called total internal have you seen that reflection you know normally we know that when light ray is moving from one medium to another there is bending not reflection it doesn't bounce back on the medium but look at what has happened there this light ray came here yes it refracted right it came out back but look at this one it came back in when it was still here this was the point of what it was still refracting because there was a change this was this is the point of critical angle when the angle of um, refraction is 90 so this point is the critical angle. you see that we put it as c this one is still normal when it traveled from um, water to air yes okay it's it's bent but look at this point this is this was the point this was the angle of what the critical period right so after this period we have the total internal reflection because it's now the angle of um, this thing incidence has exceeded the critical angle it has exceeded the critical angle and what happened look at it now we have total internal reflection so when the angle of incidence exceeds the critical angle there exists no reflection and a total what there exists no refraction sorry about that typo and the total reflection what of course this phenomenon is called total internal reflection the conditions under which total internal reflection occurs are you know when i was saying this one light rays must be traveling from a denser medium to a less dense medium let's not forget that it must be traveling from a denser medium to a less dense medium or not just when it's traveling from a less dense to a denser and the angle of incidence must exceed a critical angle let's not forget that those are the conditions what are the applications of total internal reflections? Binoculars. Binoculars use total internal reflection to reflect light through a series of prisms to magnify distant objects. You know what binoculars do? So they use this application of the total internal reflection to get a wider view so that they can magnify distant objects. The prisms are arranged in a way that the light entering the binoculars is reflected several times. Total internal reflection before reaching the viewer's eyes, resulting in a magnified image. Then we have mirage. Mirage is an optical illusion that occurs when light is refracted through air layers at different temperatures. Total internal reflections plays a role in mirages by reflecting light back towards the ground, creating the illusion of a water surface. When I know you will notice this sometimes when you are traveling and it is a very sunny, sunny day. You will notice that it is when the car is and um, the bus is moving to look as if there is water in front and rain did not fall and it's so sunny. It is what this that is what is called the mirage. So total internal reflection plays a role in mirage by reflecting light back towards the ground, creating the illusion of the water surface. So that is the application of what total internal reflection. Then we have optical fibers. Optical fibers use total internal reflection to transmit light signals over long distances. These are the applications of total internal reflection. So also total total internal reflection of radio waves. Total internal reflection of radio waves is used in radar system to detect objects. Radio waves are transmitted towards an object and the reflected waves are detected by a receiver. Then we have for the refractometer. A refractometer is an instrument that measures the refractive index of a substance. So how does it work? It works by shining a light through the substance and measuring the angle at which, at which the light is refracted. Total internal reflection is used in refractometers to ensure that the light is reflected back into the surface align for accurate measurements and that is beautiful about that we have the total reflecting prism is also important in periscope you see how important that phenomenon is so those, that is it about total internal reflection so what example i'm so sorry our board is not working today but i will try to explain as many times as possible so look at the question if the angle of incidence from on air water boundary is 60 degree calculate the angle of refraction that is actually simple right we were giving the angle of incidence to be 60 degree and now and they gave us the angle of refraction so was moving from air to water that's what they said air water boundary that is the so the right through was moving from air and it entered water so that is what this question is it calculates and we remember our snell's law Snell's law says that n is it cost to what sine i over what sine r we were giving our sine i to be 60 our our i to be 60 so getting our r should not be difficult so n which is 4 over 3 is equals to what sine is equals to sine 60 over what over what over r over sine r so sorry don't know what went wrong today 
form our this thing refused to show but let's go so having doing that having done that you'll be able to get so we have sign r is equal to four over three sine sixteen, and that is this so to get your r it will be what the sign inverse of this and you get your r i'm sure that you understand what i'm, I'm saying to get your r it will be the sign inverse of 0 0.6495 i'm sorry about the um, this thing that is not working, the board. So this question says, calculate the refractive index of a prism. If the angle of the prism is 60, remember the angle of um, the prism is 60. That is, it is a, uh, is an equilateral triangle. It is an equilateral triangle. That is why the angle is 60. An angle of minimum division D to be what? 30 degree. So simple, right? So let's put that. So we have the sign D plus A over 2. Remember how we got this? I explained to us this was gotten from what? Our Snell's law, sign I. This is this was I is equal to sign I. You know, we told we said that when I1 is equal to I2, I mean, it's also equal to what D plus A, and we we're able to get it. So 2I is equal to D plus A, then I became D plus A over 2. We did the same thing because we know that A, which is the angle of the um, tri um, equilateral triangle, is equal to 2R, right? So R is equal to A over 2. So this is as if I'm saying sign I over what? Sign R. So you can get your angle of incidence by dividing the minimum deviation plus the angle of the triangular prism divided by two. You are getting your I. Same thing goes for the words angle of refraction. You can get your R by dividing the angle of the prism by two. So let's put our parameters. What was our D? 30, right? 30 is here. What is our A? Our A is 60, yes, then divided by two, right? Cool. So we go again, then we have our A again, which was 60 divided by two. So 30 plus 60, 45 uh, 30 plus 60 is 90 right 90 divided by 2 gave us 45 so over 60 divided by 2 is 30 so we have sine 45 divided by sine 30 so doing this you're going to get 1.441 and that's the refractive index of this prism interesting right yes and you can solve any question that comes your way whenever you see things like this thank you so much for being in this class see you in our next class